Now we're drawing towards the end of the letter of Galatians and uh, the section we're looking at this evening is part of a collection of um, instructions about Christian living. And, and there really, really is quite an assortment in this little section which really is verses 1 to 10. We've dealt with uh, uh, some things in the, in the first half of this block in previous weeks and this, uh, this evening we're looking at verse 6 onwards. And uh, really what I'm doing this evening is I'm going to give you a, a very short mini-sermon and then another sermon, okay? And, and you're, you'll find out why. We're, Paul is here um, bringing up different topics. And uh, what I have done in previous weeks is I, I've really focused in and uh, we've gone very slowly at points through Galatians. Um, I could have done that, but I didn't want to with this first point that we're looking at this evening. So we're going to look basically at, if you like, a two-point sermon, but really, 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 it's not a united sermon. Uh, if we were really, if you wanted a title for our sermon this evening, then I would, I would base it on the second part of what we're looking at, which we're looking at at slightly more length, um, which would be uh, from verses um, 7 and 8 about uh, sowing to our flesh uh, and sowing, uh, sorry, sowing to the Spirit and not to our flesh. Um, that's really what we're majoring on. But we're just going to look at another little topic that's introduced in verse 6 first. And this really is a, a sort of its own little subject. So I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that first. So let's do that. Let's look at verse 6. What does it say? One who is taught the words must share in all good things with the one who teaches. Now this is a verse that I'm reluctant to preach on because it calls on churches to see that those who teach are well supported. And hopefully you can understand why I'm reluctant to teach on this. And we know that it means financially because we can look at various other passages where Paul says similar things and it's quite clear that he means financially. So you can look in um, 1 Timothy 5 verse 17 or 1 Corinthians 9 and both of those passages um, have this idea of um, um, don't, uh, it refers to an Old, Old Testament verse, uh, don't uh, muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. And from that, Paul derives the fact that those who uh, preach the word uh, should, uh, should gain some financial uh, support as they do so. Now, Elaine and I, I need to say all this sort of necessary preliminaries at the start, don't I? Elaine and I feel extremely well supported by South Street. Okay, that's the sort of basic that I need to sort of really communicate clearly. Uh, we are extremely well supported. And uh, in previous years, uh, there have been battles in the um, deacons meetings that have brought me to tears because uh, my fellow deacon, my fellow uh, you know, elders and deacons have insisted that I take uh, a pay rise. Uh, and it's just that their love and kindness has uh, actually reduced me to tears. So we are extremely well supported by you as a church, which we're very grateful for. And so this is not a call to increase my salary at all. And hopefully you can see why I didn't want to do a whole sermon on this subject as well. I'm going to deal with it as briefly and as uh, you know, hermetically sealed as possible, and then we'll put it to one side. So this is not a call to increase my salary at all, nor is it a call to increase the revenues of the church, which, thanks be to the Lord, are healthy, I think. I look at Bruce still. He's nodding still. Yeah. I was tempted, actually, to skip over verse 6, uh, um, but I generally like to deal with things as they come up in the passage. You know, uh, my... Um, uh, what's the word? My custom, my, my practice is to work through a book of the Bible and to deal with things as they come up. Um, and, and this is what come, has come up in verse 6. So uh, I generally like to deal with things as they come up and then hopefully it's not my agenda that I'm pursuing. And so uh, with some reluctance, we'll just have a brief look at this verse 6. The key word in verse 6, I think, from looking at the Greek and the word order of the Greek, it's the, it's the word that comes first in the Greek, and that's the word share. One who is taught in the word, sorry, one who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. So sharing is the underlying thought that's going on here. It's the Greek Greek verb uh, koinonio, which is related to koinonia. And so, this, uh, if you know that word at all, it's about fellowship. This is about fellowship. This verse. And so part of what it means to be a fellowship is to share in this way, to contribute together to the financial needs of the fellowship. The idea is that each household is to contribute in proportion to their means. That's the biblical principle. The principle of tithing uh, is there in the Old Testament, giving a tenth of one's income. 
And that's generally taken by New Testament Christians to be the basic level of giving uh, in the New Testament era as well. Now, I wouldn't want anyone in financial difficulties to feel pressure to give like this. I also wouldn't want anyone whose heart has not been completely rebirthed by the Lord to feel the need to give like this. But for those who are born again into a true repentance from sin and a dependence on Christ, then sharing financially with your local church for the support of its Bible teaching, amongst other things, should be the norm. And so I'd encourage any listening to this uh, to do so if you're not. And if you're visiting from other churches, then support them if you're not. Support them financially. Verse 6 feels a bit strange for me to be preaching, but I hope my motives are the same as Paul in Philippians chapter 4. Just turn over to Philippians 4 briefly. It's on page 982. Philippians 4, let me just read verses 14 to 20. And hopefully you can hear the resonance with what we're thinking about. Philippians 4, verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, writes the Apostle Paul. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Doesn't that sound like Leviticus? It does, doesn't it? And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, I can certainly concur with the beginning of verse 18. I receive full payment and more. I'm well supplied. Yes, that is the case. But uh, I'm preaching this very briefly just because I seek not, not the financial support, but I seek the that the people of God are doing what the people of God ought to be doing as, as, as far as they are able to do so. I guess also of relevance, just as I close this mini-sermon, uh, also of relevance to, to this um, from verse 6 regarding our present circumstances is our need for a treasurer. Okay? A, a local church, if it's going to be supported by the whole congregation, needs someone to coordinate all of that to coordinate all those donations, otherwise it cannot function. It's just a fact of what's needed, and so it's really sort of relevant to us in our situation. Um, And so this needs to be on our radar as a church uh, until someone is found to relieve Bruce in this role. It needs to be uh, in our prayers that we'd be praying someone, God would raise someone up to look after the finances. Okay, end of mini-sermon. Verse 6, that's that. We're going to move on now to the main sermon which is verses 7 onwards. And passages introducing various topics one after another, and now the Apostle Paul moves on, back in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, he moves on to instruction to sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh. So let me read verses 7 to 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Now these verses uh, return to the theme of chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So just a brief reminder, the believer has both the flesh, the sinful nature, that is, and the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And they draw us in opposite directions. The flesh draws us towards the works of the flesh, listed in chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 things which we have to avoid. 
The Spirit in a believer draws us to the fruit of the Spirit in its various aspects, listed in in verses 22 and 23. So the Spirit and the flesh, as long as a believer is living in this life, we have the flesh to contend with. We have the Spirit forever. We have the flesh for as long as we're in this mortal life. And we're a battleground for as long as we're in this mortal life. So a believer has a choice continually then with these two principles inside us, these two um, influences, these two sources of desires within us. We have a choice continually. Will I sow, as in sowing a seed, as in uh, indulge in the flesh? Or will I indulge in, if I could put it like that, the Spirit? Will I follow the desires of the flesh or will I follow the desires of the Spirit? Will I live as the Spirit inclines me to or as the flesh does? Now, the importance of this is underlined in verse 7 in what is surely one of the most solemn statements in the Bible. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. And therefore, we need to choose rightly and so to the spirit and not to the flesh. Let's just think about this then. It, it's so easy for people to hear the gospel message of free grace and to hear it and all its themes of undeserved forgiveness and pardon and um, blessing based not on our works but on God's free mercy And to hear all that as a license just to go and live as we please. It's so easy to interpret it like that. And our flesh will want to do that. Our flesh twists things because it's sinful and evil. And it will hear the message of grace so easily as a license to live as we please. But to conclude that, says the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit in our passage, to conclude that is to conclude that God may be mocked is to conclude that we can take God's free gifts, laughing all the way back to our unrepented of sin. And if that's what anyone listening thinks, then you need to know what verse 7 says. You are deceived. You've deceived yourself. There is no salvation through Christ for those who feel totally at liberty to carry on sinning as they please because somehow grace has it covered. There's no salvation in Christ for those who feel totally at liberty to carry on sinning as they please. Such a belief is not a gospel belief. It's an anti-gospel belief. It's an anti-God belief. The gospel is about God's sovereign triumph over sin through grace. The false libertine gospel makes out that sin ultimately triumphs. It's an anti-gospel message. Now, many people with um, a Pelagian theology, what's a Pelagian theology? A Pelagian theology is, is a false theology that says we are, base, we are saved based on our works. Okay, so you can think of Roman Catholic theology, for example. Not only that, but others as well. Um, That's named after a a, a theologian who is sadly British called Pelagius. Um, And so many people with with a theology like that have said to people like us who believe the Bible's message of grace, salvation through grace alone, they've said of people like us that licentious living, just living as you please, is the inevitable consequence of salvation by grace alone. So many people have accused, in fact, you have it in the Bible even, the Apostle Paul, beginning of Romans 6. People have accused him, it seems, quite clearly there. People have accused him of saying, you can live as you please because grace has it covered. That's not what Paul was teaching. That is not the Bible's message. And many people with this sort of works-based theology have said that just licentious living, sinful living, just living there, any thought of repenting from sin is a natural consequence of the gospel of grace. Well, that is emphatically not the case. A person would only think that if they've never known the power of God's Spirit in their hearts, regenerating them and rebirthing 
them and giving them a new heart. You see, a person who is truly born again has the fear of God ingrained in their new heart. God rebirths a person when he does it. He rebirths them with a new heart that has the fear of him written indelibly on their heart, on their new heart. And so they know that sin is not to be continued in. They know that sin is to be humbly repented of in dust and ashes before God. They know not to mock God by the presumption to continue in sin. They hate their sin and long to be rid of its presence and not simply released from its punishment, but released from its presence as well, cleansed of it in their lives. So let me just ask this evening, is there anyone here who is thinking of holding on to your sin in any way in the face of God's holy sovereignty and lordship? If so, then repent in dust and ashes. Repent in utter self-abasement before God and humbly submit your sin to the awesome, victorious power of the blood of Christ, like we thought about this morning, which has the power to conquer sin and not simply to forgive it, which it does, but to wash us of its presence. And so if anyone is thinking to hold on to their sin, and somehow think to, that grace will get you through if you just hold on to your sin anyway. You need to repent. You need to f- let your sin fall beneath the feet of Christ. You need to lay out your feet before the Lord Jesus for his blood to be sprinkled on it, to be washed of it, both forgiving you and changing you. Now, it's possible that for some here, maybe... T- for some, the, the presumption that has to fall before the cross and throne of Christ is the presumption that your sin is too great for God to deal with, for Christ's blood to deal with. No, that is not the case for anyone. Or maybe for some, it's the presumption that your sin is something that you have to sort out. You have to figure out. You have to put right. Well, obviously there's repentance, but no, we cannot sort our sin out. Or maybe for some, the presumption that has to fall is that the biggest problem of your sin is its offensiveness to you and not to God. No, your sin is against God and him alone, Psalm 51. And only he can sort it out, and he can sort it out. So I plead with anyone for whom this is relevant to lay your sin at the foot of the cross and to trust in the mighty saving power of Jesus and his blood, to deal with it and take it away, to erase it, to change you from the inside out, to make you a new creation with a right fear of God, a right hatred of sin, a right aversion to the thought of mocking God. All of that written indelibly into your heart. Now let me now turn to believers. Let me now turn to those who are seeking to please the Lord in in your in your life. You do not treat the grace of God as a license to sin. So I'm speaking to you now. Let's explore what sowing to the Spirit does and doesn't mean. There is a false idea current at the moment of what this means that needs to be dealt with. There are many prosperity gospel preachers who use this idea of sowing, like in our verse in our little passage here, sowing a seed, who use that idea as a means to persuade people to give a donation in order to secure a blessing of God. It might be for healing, it might be for something else, some other sort of blessing of this life, a promotion, whatever it is. And so there is the idea, you, you sow a seed, uh, ching ching, out pops whatever blessing you're hoping for. Now, that, that is emphatically not what our passage is talking about, and I just need to sort of make that really clear, hopefully. It's a pagan idea, not a gospel idea. For a start, the reaping here is eternal life, end of verse 8. It is not a healing. It is not um, some, something of benefit to our sort of earthly life. 
It's none of nothing like that. It's eternal life. That's the reaping that's taught, spoken of here. And the sowing to the Spirit in the context of the whole letter is not a donation, but it's a whole life of walking by the Spirit. That's what it says in chapter 5, verse 16. Walk by the Spirit. And again in chapter 5, verse 25, walk by the Spirit. Walking in love and all the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Loving our neighbour as ourselves, which is quoted in chapter 5. Doing good to others, verse 10 of, our, of chapter 6. Doing good to others, especially those of the household of faith. So the sowing to the Spirit is not simply, you know, uh, just make, you know, put your credit card here and you've sown a seed and expect something to result. That, that is not the idea at all. The, the reaping is eternal life. The sowing is not make a donation, but it's a whole life lived, walking by the Spirit. And the sowing and reaping is not a slot machine sort of mechanistic idea of securing God's blessings by our deeds. That's, uh, as I said earlier, that's a pagan idea. It's a false gospel of earning God's blessings by our works. That This whole letter is written against that. This whole letter is about saying, not by your works, not by works of the law, Let's just read a few places. Chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. This is Paul talking maybe to Peter here. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law will no one be justified. And this just goes through the whole letter like a thread. The whole letter has this theme to it. That's why Paul committed pen to paper in the first place. So this sow a seed theology of these prosperity teachers is actually, it's pagan, it's actually very similar to um, the theology of Rome at the time of the Reformation. I don't know if you know, but the, one of the things that provoked Martin Luther to, to, to nail his 95 theses to the, uh, the door of the castle church of Wittenberg uh, was the sale of indulgences. And the, uh, the little ditty that went along then was, when a coin in a coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. That's the sort of sow a seed theology of the gospel, of the um, prosperity false teachers of our day. And reformers like Luther vigorously refuted that from Galatians, amongst other places. This is a letter that does not support that idea one little bit. So what does sowing to the spirit and not to the flesh mean then? We've heard what it doesn't mean. What does it mean? Well, let's hear verses 7 and 8 again. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. The point then is this. We cannot expect to live for ourselves, to live for our own pleasure, contrary to God's will, regardless of God's will, and expect finally to be saved. If we sow that sort of lifestyle, then we will reap a very different end from salvation. We will reap, it says, corruption. In other words, destruction. Our undoing in hell, if that's how we live. Those who reap eternal life are those, on the contrary, who, let's think in the terms of the letter, those who live by faith in the Son of God, chapter 2, verse 20. There's that beautiful there description of, of, of Paul's own faith in Christ. Let's read it, chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is Paul there in that little autobiographical, autobiographical verse? Is he living for himself? Is he living for his own pleasure? Is he sowing to the flesh? No, he's not. He's living by faith in the Son of God. 
So people who reap eternal life are people who have a faith like that, who crucify the flesh and its passions. Chapter 5, verse 24. People who live day by day by the Spirit of God in them, turn, turning them to God. Chapter 4, verse 6, there's that lovely verse about um, because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That speaks of a of God's Spirit in our hearts that turns us up to God in love and devotion and submission, filial submission, like a son to a father, and prayer. That's the sort of thing that sowing to the Spirit means. And just bringing in Proverbs 4 that we looked, looked at earlier. Remember that verse there, verse 23 of Proverbs 4. Keep, or, or maybe better, guard your heart with all diligence, it says, with, with all vigilance. Guard your heart. Be very careful how you live. Be very careful what your heart is drawn to. You have these two principles in you, the spirit and the flesh. Be very careful to sow to the spirit. Guard your heart with all vigilance, being careful not to indulge the sinful desires of the flesh, but the good desires of the spirit. Now let's just think practically for a moment as we sort of draw to a close. It's amazing how much we can guard our heart so that we do sow to the spirit and not to the flesh. So we do live by the desires of the spirit and not by the desires of the flesh. So, for example, we can be aware of when a particular web page that we're idly browsing through is about to take us down a bad path. Ever experienced that? You're browsing, you're just, uh, just interested, you're flicking around a few things, uh, and you're just aware that if you just carry on doing this for a few minutes, you might do something that you shouldn't do. And so guarding your heart in that situation mean, means... Shutting that down, just closing the opportunity for that, closing the tab, clicking on the X, getting rid of it. We can be aware of when our flesh, our sinful nature, is beginning to be activated and interested in something that's sinful. And so we're to cut that off dis decisively at that moment by turning the TV off or whatever it might be. Or well, positively, we can decide to spend that spare bit of time that we have to do something that stirs our spiritual taste buds. Our spiritual delight. Maybe read a few pages of a good Christian book that you've got on the go or maybe had on the go a while ago and need to bring back and start reading again. That's positively what we can do for guarding our heart and sowing to the Spirit. There are less spontaneous measures that we can take as well. Cultivating good habits, things like keeping phones out of bathrooms and bedrooms and other private spaces. Ensuring that computer screens are turned towards the door of the room and not away from the door of the room. Never using a private browser window. Disabling apps on your phone even. Let your spouse have the key to those disabled apps. There's accountability software that you, that, uh, that you can use, and I, I know people that use this. All sorts of things that can help us to guard our heart and sow to the Spirit. Now, none of these is foolproof, or we might say better, none of these is sin-proof. They're not. We're not going to find something sin-proof. We're not looking for something sin-proof. But for a person genuinely seeking to live to please the Lord, there are practical ways like this where we can guard our heart and ensure that we sow to the Spirit and not to please the flesh. But all of these practical steps are only of any use if we have a true fear of the Lord ingrained in our heart. If we have a true grasp of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That needs to be the fuel behind this. That needs to be the, the heart that burns from which we will then so to the Spirit and not to the flesh. So let's pray then that we would have a true fear of the Lord ingrained in our hearts and that would grow and that we would grow in the grace of the Lord. Let's pray together.